So we've been looking at this letter of Peter's, and one of the big themes is, is about suffering. And, uh, you know, that's something that as Christians we will go through in various degrees. And we just left it last time, verse 17. It says, For it's better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. So the call of the Christian is um, not just to suffer for doing evil. We're not called to do evil, but as anyone as a human being, if you do wrong, sometimes you will suffer because of it. There will be consequences because of the evil that you do. But the call of the Christian is to actually suffer for doing good. And Peter takes us on to, to the great example, the greatest example, the source of our understanding and our strength in what it means to suffer for doing good. And obviously our great understanding and our great example is the Lord Jesus Christ. But just to set the scene a little bit, last time I was talking about how we um, you know, are called out from the world that we've become light, but we're still in a dark world, but God's taken us through this, this world, and he's going to bring us to glory one day, which is a wonderful thought. So there is a sense that we need to keep ourselves walking in the light, to keep ourselves holy, you know, trusting the Lord, coming to him regularly, you know, when we sin, keeping short accounts, coming to God and asking him to cleanse us. But, you know, God's plan for you isn't just that he brings you through this life to glory. God's plan also is that you bring others to Christ so that they too might come into his light and they too might be brought into his glory. There's always the call on the Christian to, to tell other people, to tell the gospel, to lead others, to bring others to Christ Jesus, to point them to Christ Jesus. And the reason we bring them to Christ is as it says there in verse 18, that he might bring us to God. Our job as believers is, is to, that we can't bring anyone to God, but we can come like Philip and we can tell people and say, look, this is Jesus. He's the way. He's the one who can bring us to God. So our great example there is verse 18, for Christ also suffered. So we see in Christ's life that he was rejected and misunderstood by his family in a, in a lot of ways. They didn't understand who he was. And you know, there's a sense there that his brothers mocked him a little bit. Um, he was definitely rejected by the religious community. He was rejected in, by, in the main by his own nation, his own people. But Jesus' greatest suffering wasn't any of those. His greatest suffering and the pinnacle of his suffering was obviously him dying upon the cross. Verse 18 says, Christ also suffered once for sins. He suffered on the cross, a one-time event, so that we might be forgiven. But Christ's suffering was focused upon what happened upon the cross. You get something of like this as you read through the Gospels, in talking to his disciples and they're saying, oh yeah, you know, we'll, we want these great places of honor in heaven. He says to them, are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? He's on about there about drinking the cup of God's wrath, in a sense, of, God, of ultimate suffering. Are you able to drink that cup of suffering? This is the call of the Christian, is to drink the cup of suffering, so that we might share one day in that heavenly banquet. As you know, when we break bread together and we look forward to not, not only back to what Christ has done, but we look forward to the time when we'll drink it anew in the kingdom of God. But in the meantime, are we able to drink that cup? Um, Jesus says in Luke 12, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. He knew that he was going to be baptized with fire. He knew that he was going to be baptized with the baptism of suffering. He wrestled with that. He knew it was coming, and he says that his, he was in great distress because of it. And it did come that day when he was crucified. We see something of his physical pain, his pain in his body. We see the soldiers thrusting a crown of thorns upon his head. We read about Jesus 
probably been whipped twice from John's Gospel. There's a sense there of a, of a flogging. There's a punishment which might dissuade him and, and hopefully appease the crowd that they might say, let him go. But the crowd only cried out, crucify. So Jesus was scourged. That flogging, which was intended to put someone near to death as they were led away to be crucified. We think about Christ's exhaustion. We think about him not even being able to carry his cross. We think about the hunger that he must have been going through, the thirst that he was experiencing. But then ultimately, the nails that were driven into his hands and into his feet. The sufferings of Christ, because he loved us. But then there's the suffering of his soul. The agony of the Son of God. Who's always been in intimate fellowship, oneness with his Father. But somehow in his, his human form, being separated from his Father for that, that moment, as he bore the sins of his people upon his shoulders. The darkness, the agony, way more than any physical pain that he'd gone through. The separation of being separated from, from the love of his Father for that time. It says here that he was made alive in the Spirit in verse 18. It says he was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. In other translations it talks about by the Spirit. I don't know if you look in your translation there. Um, when they use the word Spirit with a little s, it's talking about the human spirit. When it's there with a big s, it's talking about the Holy Spirit. You'll find it different in different translations. But um, if it's by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit is a reference to him being resurrected. He was put to death in the flesh, but by the power of the Holy Spirit he came back to life, which is indeed true. If it's to do with the human spirit, then somehow, you know, if the Spirit is made alive, then that would suggest that somehow the Spirit had died, which personally I can't go along with. I think Jesus, though, in his pain and his suffering, there was something about the, the pressure upon his soul that would have felt like death. When he's there in Gethsemane, he says, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. This is how much Christ Jesus was crushed so that we might be restored. We might be remade. We might be born again. We might become a new creation in Christ. So Christ suffered, and it, but as it says there, the reason he suffered in verse 18 is that he might bring us to God. We read in Hebrews 9, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. But we also read as we go through Hebrews that it doesn't matter how many animals are sacrificed, their blood can never wash away our sin. But Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. He's the fulfillment of all the Old Testament sacrifices. They all point towards the precious blood of the Son of God being poured out. And because his blood has been poured out, there is forgiveness for sins. The great exchange of the cross. Read that in verse 18. He suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Paul brings it out in a slightly different way in 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So people use that word imputed, which means, you know, sort of put upon. So our sin was put upon Christ. And in return, we receive Christ's righteousness is put upon us. That's why we can stand before a holy God, because of this wonderful exchange, the cross. We know that in Christ's death, the curtain had been torn in two. And it says here that Christ died to bring us to God. Literally that means, it's got the, the idea of to gain an audience in court. We think of God as, as the judge. He is the judge of all mankind. 
But through what Christ has done, it means that we can actually come and we can gain an audience in court with our Heavenly Father. Not standing there as the accused, but we can come in. The wonderful thing is now, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, is that the person who's, who's there as judge, the Heavenly Father, in Christ, we become his friends. In Christ, the judge becomes our Father. He may discipline his life, and he will discipline us because he loves us, but we don't need to fear him anymore in terms, as Christians, as being judge. So he died so that he might bring us to God. And it says there in verse 21, this interesting thing about baptism. It says, baptism which corresponds to this. If you just read back and you think about what's, what's baptism corresponding to, what's the baptism got to do with what Peter's bringing us to? He start, he's talking there about Noah, the story of Noah, and it's tied in with the resurrection as well. As you read down in verse 21, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we read there in, in Genesis chapter 6 about the situation before Noah came, the, the depravity of the human race at that time. Genesis 6 says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So the whole mankind just poured out doing evil continually. Phil's just prayed a prayer this morning, which is echo something of that, that when he looks out, the people around in the world, that's the picture that he seems to be coming back with. The people are just continually doing evil and don't seem to care about it. And God said, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land. So the picture there was with, with Noah. The flood coming is a picture of, of God's righteous judgment upon human sin and rebellion against God. God as the judge has got the right to do that. If he made this race of people and they rebel against him, he's, he's got the authority as God to come and to bring judgment and to bring an end to them, to stop the evil upon the earth. He's got a right to do that. But what the Bible explains is that, that this, what happened with Noah is a picture of what's going to happen in the future. It's a picture of the future judgment that will come upon the world. And in the same way that the waters covered the whole earth, there was nowhere to escape the flood waters. You could go to the highest mountain, but you were still going to drown. Is that when Christ comes back and judges, there's nowhere to hide. There's no way you can flee to hide away from it. There's no mountain that you can climb to get away from it. You can't hide in a cave or a nuclear bunker or whatever you're planning. Yeah? There's no, you can't hide. This is the picture that God paints. Most of the people perished in the floodwaters, except eight of them. They were lifted up above the waters. Baptism which corresponds to this. This is the link with the resurrection. Is that the resurrection lifts us above the judgment. Only those who know the power of the resurrection will be lifted above the waters of God's judgment. And it's shown here in baptism, because it says baptism which corresponds to this. Baptism which corresponds to something that God was doing with Noah in terms of the ark lifting them above the waters. Baptism which corresponds to something that God's doing with the resurrection, that knowing the power of Jesus' resurrection lifts us above the, the judgment that will come to the world. But how does it do it? There's a line here which many people in church history have gone astray with. It says, it talks about baptism which saves you. Verse 21, baptism which corresponds to this now saves you. And it goes on to say, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I read earlier there that from Ephesians, by grace you have been saved. 
So, you know, most people would agree throughout church history that it's God's grace that saves us. But the interesting thing is, is, is how do we receive God's grace? Many in the church have gone astray throughout the centuries because they've believed that we receive God's grace through baptism. As if somehow taking a child or even an adult and baptizing them in the name of the, of the Lord, that that would, would cleanse them from original sin. That would put them right before God. That would be the means by which they received the grace of God and it was applied to them as a human being. But we know that the waters of baptism in that way can never wash us. There's only one substance known to man that can wash you on the inside and wash away your sin. And that's the blood of Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing else will wash. Nothing else will, you know, it says there, removal of dirt from the body. You can, water will, you have a shower, it will clean your body. But if you pass through water, it can't clean your heart. It can't transform you. It can't make you right before God. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse us. So how do we receive this cleansing from God? Is it through baptism? No. For by grace you've been saved through faith. We receive it through faith. We receive all that Christ has done for us by believing. Simply by believing. Through faith we receive it. And then that wonderful exchange is applied to us. My sin goes to Christ. Christ's righteousness comes to me. I get to live in the truth of that reality. That I'm born again by the Spirit of God. It comes through faith. And in the illustration with Noah, faith gets on the ark. The door was open. People went through the waters, but they all drowned, apart from those who actually got on the ark. And baptism, our baptism, shows that we've got on the ark, if you want to put it that way. It shows that by faith we've received forgiveness in Christ. It shows that by faith we've been united in Christ, in all that Christ has done, in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, in his ascension, that we're, we're in Christ and we've received all the good benefits that Christ has won for us. Our baptism declares that. As we go down under the water, we're declaring, I am dead with Christ because I'm one with Christ through faith. I'm buried with Christ. My sins have been taken away. They're dead and buried. No longer will they come back and haunt me. They've been taken away. And as you, we emerge from the waters of baptism, it just speaks about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we have been raised in Christ. He says positionally that we're already in Christ in the heavenly realm, seated in Him at the right hand of the Father. One day we'll know the, the glory of the truth of that in its fullness. That one day what God declares will be true about us in our experience, that we will be caught up, stood there before the throne of God. In God's courtroom, we've truly gained an audience in the court of the Almighty to worship Him and to praise Him forever. Verse 19. He went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Jesus went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. This is um, a very controversial text that many people have scratched their head about probably um, was used in some ways in the formation of the Apostles Creed which is based on a, a third century baptismal creed that people would declare before they were baptized um, the Apostles Creed reads like this Jesus was crucified died was buried he descended into hell the third day he rose again from the dead. That bit there, he descended into hell, is, is the nub of the controversy. He descended into hell. 
Some church traditions have taken that bit out. I was very interested to see, as I was preparing this, that the Anglican Church have changed the word from hell to death. He's descended into death, which is a, an interesting statement and actually opens a door to a whole understanding of theology. But he descended into hell. But the question is, is did Jesus really descend into hell? And if you look here in verse 19, it says, He went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. So the word prison there is, the assumption is that it's talking about hell. And there are some overtones in scripture that, that would support that. That the prison there that, that Peter's talking about is actually a reference to hell itself. Um, the word spirits there is, is quite rightly, people would often say that it's, it's used of the word angels. You know, when you talk about the um, spirits, you don't talk, tend to talk about human beings as such. They use the word souls, which is, is um, if you look down again in, uh, where did it go? Eight it says eight persons there in verse 20. The word there actually is literally souls. So it's been translated persons. You talk about someone, as, you talk about how many souls are at church today. You're talking about not how many disembodied people were here but we're talking about how many people were here yeah so but normally the word here is for spirit is used with angels some people see it as a reference back to Genesis chapter 6 obviously the context being there with Noah it says the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive so that you know there's this belief that somehow the angels somehow married human women and had children and as a result of that, that those angels were, these are the angels who've been put in hell, who've been bound in prison. A captivating idea. But I don't think there's much biblical warrant for it. Perhaps an illusion in Second Peter chapter 2. But there's no clear Bible teaching. And actually, even in the same passage that we read, verse 22 it actually uses a different word for angels rather than spirits. So I don't think there's much warrant there. But the question is, is did Jesus descend into hell? The only sense that he could have done, really, is that, that moment on the cross where he bore the sin of the world. So it's not that after he was resurrected that somehow he descended. If he experienced anything of hell, it was that moment while he was dying upon the cross. While he was taking our sins upon us. While it says that there was darkness from the sixth to the ninth hour. But we know that that's the only possibility really. It says in Psalm 16, You will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. That's, or another word, different use of that word. Or see the pit. More convincingly, Luke 23, 46. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The moment that Jesus Christ died, we know that his body was then to be placed in a tomb. But his spirit was to be received instantly by the Father. So this proclamation here, he went and he proclaimed to the Spirit. It's probably more likely to be a reference to the proclamation of what Noah was proclaiming at that time on the earth. And in fact, Noah was um, proclaiming Christ Noah's big sermon, if you want to call it a sermon, was, it would have entitled it The Ark. But his big sermon was all about Jesus. It was all about the salvation that was to come in Jesus Christ. Noah, who's described in Second Peter as, as a herald of righteousness, was there, he was, he was building the ark, was proclaiming the only way of salvation. He was proclaiming a type and a shadow of the one who would come. The only one who can deliver us from the waters of judgment that would come. 
this consuming judgment that's going to come across upon the world. The only way to escape is through the ark. Noah was declaring really in type form that the only way of escape is through faith in Jesus Christ. In, con in the context of the flood in 2 Peter chapter 3 we read that the Lord is patient towards you not wishing any should perish but all should reach repentance. In the proclaiming of Noah, as Noah is building this ark, which apparently some people estimate was between, took between 55 and 75 years to build the ark. During this time of building, it's like God's saying, here we go, the message is there. This is the only way of salvation. A flood's going to come upon the earth, and this is the only way to escape that flood. God's been patient with the people in the times of Noah. Like God's been patient with us now. Today is the day of salvation. The door is open. Anyone who wants to come can come through the door of Christ. Can come onto the ark. Can will experience something of the resurrection. When the judgment comes, they will be lifted above the judgment and will be saved. God is patient. But his patience runs out. One day, it started raining. One day, the earth split and the water started coming up, rising up. One day, the door on that ark was shut. And we read that it wasn't Noah or his family that shut the door, but God himself shut the door of the ark. One day, it will be too late to turn to Christ. The door of the ark will be shut. For these people who rejected, they were all drowned. And in their death that separation came. Their body and their spirit were separated, which is in essence is the definition of what death is. Their bodies decayed in the floodwaters, but their spirits are held in prison. Awaiting the judgment. There's no second chance. People have seen this thing about Jesus going, you know, and proclaiming to the spirits in prison as if somehow, you know, hopefully that, that God might have a second chance that once you're dead, you know, Jesus is still going to come and say, you sure about this? You, I know you've had a, your time on earth, but are you really sure now you're dead? Now you've tasted a little bit of the edge of hell. Are you sure that you don't want to actually get right with God and, and I'll give you a second chance? There are no second chances. Once the door's shut or once you're dead, that's it. In Hebrews it says, it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes the judgment. Not after that Jesus is going to come and preach to you while you're dead and then you've got another chance. Appointed once to die and after that the judgment. When you read that chilling account in Luke 16 of the rich man and Lazarus, it says between us, in Luke 16, between us, us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not do so, and none may cross from there to us. So we see there the rich man who's received all the blessings, all the good things of this life. When he dies, he's, he's there in hell. But he can look up and he can see this, this poor beggar, Lazarus, who's there at Abraham's bosom in heaven. But there's this chasm has been fixed between the two, between heaven and hell. And it's been fixed at the point when they died. There was no, no getting from one to the other. The chasm had been fixed. And he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. We see that the rich man realizes that his fate is sealed, but he's begging, please send someone to go and preach 
the gospel to those whom I love who are still alive before it's too late. You know, people are in prison now in one sense. They're bound up in their sin. They're bound under the power of the devil. But we have a gospel to proclaim that sets men and women free in the name of Jesus. This gospel can deliver people from the clutches of the devil and bring them to salvation in Jesus Christ. It's the only way that people can be saved. And we've been given the responsibility. We can't bring people to God, but we can tell them the gospel and point them to Christ. We've got the opportunity now, as the rich man is there pleading, please send someone to my five brothers to tell them that they can avoid this place and they can enjoy the glories of heaven. We've been given the responsibility to go out and to tell people that there's salvation in the name of Jesus. That the prison that you find yourself in now, in sin, you can be set free in Jesus' name so that you'll never face the prison of hell. But you'll come into God's glorious presence forever. How much did Noah suffer? People often talk about Noah being mocked and what have you. Um, there's no actual record in the Bible of him being mocked. It's just that you think, you know, he's there in a desert land building a boat for 70 years and everyone's, you know, you can imagine, like, what are you doing that for, you weirdo? But isn't that a bit like us with church? What do you go to church for, you weirdo? Why are you doing that? Don't you know that we're going to fix the planet and it's all going to be all right and everything's just going to go on as normal? Why do you go to church? Why do you believe in Jesus? Noah's there. His building of the ark is, is, is his proclamation of Christ. Continually. That's what it was all about. From the moment God called him, it says that he went and did it. That's what his life was about. His life had changed. I don't know what Noah... You can tell me later if you know what Noah did before he was an art builder. I don't know. But, but he stopped doing whatever he was doing. And his whole life was about building the ark. In, in a sense, the analogy for us is that our whole lives should be about pointing people to the way of salvation. Pointing people to Jesus Christ. But he may have suffered some mocking. But you know the greatest pain probably? And I mentioned it the other week. You know one of the most discouraging things is, is, is we're building the ark for God as we're telling people about Jesus. Is apathy. People just a sense, yeah, I've heard that, not interested. If it's good for you, then whatever, but I, I don't care. Noah built this ark, but only eight people got on it. I'm sure he would have had some help from some laborers, would have helped him at least bring the wood in and you know, maybe chop it up or prepare it a little bit or whatever. But there would have been others involved in the building of the ark. You know, sometimes we, we get people who are loosely surrounded within church life and they're helping to build the art, they're helping to build up the ministry, they're helping to proclaim Christ in some way, but yet they never get on the ark. Christ died to bring us to God. Get on the ark. If you've never got on the ark, I'm pleading with you, get on on the ark. Come to Christ in faith. Come and receive his forgiveness. Come and ask him to wash away your sin, that you might be born again, that you might experience his resurrection, that you might come into a place where you know that you can stand before him on judgment day and not fear, not because of what you've done, because what of Christ has done. You know that when the judgment comes, you will rise above it and you'll be lifted to, to the glories forever. Come to the ark. And in our continued labor for the Lord, you know, what we face 
is slight inconvenience. We don't really go through much trouble, really, as Christians in the West. Slight inconvenience. But the message we're proclaiming, the one who we're bringing to, just think, as we've looked this morning, about the sufferings of Christ. Think about what he went through so that people might be saved. And then put it in perspective about what we are perhaps not willing to go through just because we're maybe too embarrassed or we want to just keep our light hidden a little bit. May I encourage us all, and myself in this, to be courageous, to point people to Jesus, to speak up when we need to speak up, to not be afraid to hand someone a Bible and say, have you ever read about, about Jesus? Let's be courageous in these things. Because we know, verse 22, we've been talking about the resurrection, but this really is what Christ's sufferings won for us. Christ who has gone into heaven and is, is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities and powers having been subjected to him. Through faith in Jesus we're included in this wonderful and glorious victory. A victory that will be celebrated throughout the whole of eternity. May we yield our lives to Christ afresh to be used in his service to point people to Jesus, the one who can bring us to God. Amen.